As the Detroit sun filtered through the diner windows, James Marshall, a 42-year-old black police officer, stepped out of his car and into a familiar refuge. Today, he wasn't clad in his usual uniform but wore a simple t-shirt and jeans, his badge tucked away. This was his day off, a rare moment to unwind. The diner, a local favorite known for its mouth-watering burgers and homely ambience, beckoned him with the scent of sizzling patties and freshly brewed coffee. James had frequented this place since he moved to the neighborhood 10 years ago, drawn in by its warm, inclusive vibe and friendly faces. As he pushed open the door, the familiar chime greeted him, followed by the soft murmur of conversations and the clatter of dishes. The interior was modest, adorned with framed pictures of Detroit landmarks and booths lined with red vinyl. It was not crowded today, a few families and solo diners scattered throughout, enjoying their meals. James's eyes scanned the room, searching for a friendly face. He found one in Sarah, the waitress who had served him countless times before. She greeted him with a nod and a smile, making her way over with a menu in hand. James headed towards his usual booth by the window, the one with a view of the bustling street outside. Settling into the booth, he felt a sense of relief wash over him. Here, he was just James, not Officer Marshall. He looked forward to a simple pleasure, a juicy burger with extra pickles, just the way he liked it. As he prepared to dive into the menu, his relaxed demeanor was suddenly interrupted. A heavy hand slammed down on the menu before he could open it. Startled, James looked up into the eyes of a man he didn't recognize. This man, burly and with a stern expression, was definitely not Sam, the usual manager. The air around them grew tense, the friendly chatter of the diner fading into the background. Hold on there, the man said, his voice tinged with hostility. Are you lost? James, taken aback by the confrontation, replied with a calm yet confused tone, just here for a burger, like always. The man leaned in, scrutinizing James from head to toe with a disdainful look. This isn't the place for folks like you, he stated bluntly, snatching the menu away and tossing it onto another table. James's heart sank as he processed the words. The atmosphere of the diner shifted palpably. What was once a sanctuary seemed now a battleground. Uh, folks like me? He stammered, his voice a mix of confusion and rising anger. The man scoffed. Yes, folks that look like you. His gaze piercing. He then turned away, leaving James sitting there, a storm of emotions brewing within him. The once comforting smell of burgers now left a bitter taste in the air. As the man walked away, James sat frozen, grappling with the blatant discrimination he had just faced. This encounter wasn't just an interruption to his day, it was a stark reminder of the undercurrents of racism that still pervaded even the most familiar places. The initial shock slowly turned into a simmering resolve. James knew he couldn't let this go. This moment, as painful as it was, sparked something within him, a need to stand up not just for himself, but for anyone who had ever been told, this isn't the place for you. As the man's words hung in the air, a heavy silence fell over the diner. The once familiar sounds of laughter and chatter were now replaced by an uneasy quiet. James sat, stunned and rooted to his spot, as the man walked away with a dismissive wave of his hand. The other patrons, though clearly uncomfortable, avoided eye contact, choosing instead to focus intently on their meals. But James couldn't let it go. His role as an officer compelled him to stand against injustice, but more than that, his personal dignity was at stake. He rose from his seat, his heart pounding in his chest, and followed the man to the counter. Excuse me, James called out, his voice firm yet controlled. I think we need to talk about what you just said. The man turned around, his expression souring further. There's nothing to talk about. I told you to leave, and I meant it. The surrounding diners paused, 
their forks midway to their mouths as the tension escalated. James, standing tall and composed, responded, you can't refuse service based on someone's race. That's illegal. A mocking laugh escaped the man. Oh, is the cop going to teach me about the law? He sneered. Before James could react, the man shoved him roughly in the chest. The push caught James off guard, and he stumbled backward, knocking over a chair. His police instincts kicked in. He could handle himself in a physical confrontation, but he was off-duty and without his badge. Still, defending himself was now a necessity. As James regained his footing, the man advanced, throwing a clumsy punch aimed at his face. James dodged swiftly, the officer training evident in his movements. He grabbed the man's arm, twisting it behind his back, and pushed him against the counter. The physical altercation drew gasps from the onlookers, their meals forgotten. Enough! James shouted, his voice echoing in the now silent diner. I didn't want it to come to this. Struggling and cursing, the man tried to break free, but James held firm. In the scuffle, a sharp pain shot through James's shoulder, a reminder of an old injury from his years on the force. He grimaced, the pain flashing across his face, but he maintained his grip. Finally, realizing the futility of his efforts, the man relaxed and James slowly released him, ensuring he didn't make another move. Panting, James straightened up, his eyes scanning the room. The onlookers were a mix of shocked and awed, but no one came forward. James, breathing heavily, addressed the room. This isn't just about me. It's about standing up against hatred and discrimination. If we let it happen to one of us, it sets a precedent for all of us. The man, now subdued, muttered under his breath as he rubbed his restrained arm. James knew he had won the physical altercation, but the victory felt hollow. There would be consequences. He was an officer involved in a public dispute, and his actions today could lead to scrutiny or worse, disciplinary action. With a deep sense of foreboding, James gathered his belongings. He left the diner without his meal, his appetite lost to the bitter taste of the confrontation. As he stepped outside, the bright light of day seemed harsh, reflecting his turmoil. He wondered about the repercussions of today's events, both for his career and for the community he had sworn to protect. He knew this incident wouldn't just fade away. It was a spark in a powder keg of societal tensions, and James was now at the center of it. James sat in the quiet of his living room, the events of the diner replaying in his mind like a bad movie. His shoulder throbbed painfully, a physical reminder of the altercation. He had applied ice, but the deeper ache, the sting of injustice, was harder to soothe. His phone lay next to him, silent, as if the world was holding its breath. But the peace was short-lived. His phone buzzed relentlessly, texts and calls lighting up the screen. It was his captain, several colleagues, and a few unknown numbers likely the media, sniffing out a story. With a deep breath, he picked up the phone to call his captain first. James, what the hell happened? Captain Rodriguez's voice was a mix of concern and admonishment. James explained the situation as calmly as he could, emphasizing his attempts to de-escalate and how things had spiraled despite his efforts. I didn't start it, sir, but I couldn't just stand there. I know, James, I know, the captain sighed, but you know how this looks, right? An off-duty officer involved in a fight, it's not good. Internal affairs will be on this first thing in the morning. James nodded, even though the captain couldn't see. I understand. I'll come in and give a full statement. After hanging up, James felt a sinking feeling. He knew the captain was right. The implications of this incident could be severe. Despite his intentions, the optics were damaging. He needed to prepare himself for the fallout. His personal phone rang next. It was Maria, the single mother he had recently helped in a community outreach program. Her voice was full of worry. 
James, I just saw a video of the diner fight. It's all over social media. Are you okay? James hesitated, then admitted, I've been better. Thanks for checking in, Maria. They talked a bit more, her concern a small comfort in the storm that was brewing. After promising to keep her updated, he hung up, feeling the weight of his isolation. Despite the room's stillness, his mind raced. Tomorrow, he would face the consequences at the precinct. James walked into the precinct, a palpable tension greeting him as his colleagues eyed him with a mixture of concern and curiosity. He was immediately ushered into internal affairs where he spent the next few hours recounting the incident, his words recorded, and his demeanor scrutinized. After what felt like an eternity, he was allowed to leave the interrogation room. On his way out, he noticed a group of reporters gathered outside the precinct. His heart sank further. The story was not just internal now, it had caught the public's eye. As he approached, microphones were thrust in his direction, and questions were fired at him like bullets. Officer Marshall, were you racially profiled at the diner? Do you believe the police department supports you? What will you do next? James paused, looking at the sea of faces awaiting his response. He knew he had to be careful with his words. With a steady voice, he said, I believe in justice, not just for myself, but for everyone. This incident will be thoroughly investigated, and I trust that the truth will prevail. He didn't stop for more questions, walking through the crowd and into the uncertain days ahead. The fallout from the diner incident rippled through the community, stirring a mix of outrage, support, and divisive debates. James found himself at the center of a storm that spread far beyond the confines of the local diner. As he walked through his neighborhood, whispers followed him like shadows. Some residents nodded in solidarity, while others averted their eyes, uncomfortable or disapproving. Determined to not let the incident isolate him, James decided to visit the local community center where he often volunteered. The center was a microcosm of the city's diverse population, a place where people from all walks of life came together. Today, it was bustling with the usual after-school activities and adult education classes. As he entered, James was greeted by Ms. Linda, the center's director. Her warm smile was a welcome relief. James, I've been hearing a lot. How are you holding up? She asked, concern evident in her tone. Just taking it one day at a time, Linda. James replied, trying to muster a smile. It's not easy, but I'm here. Linda nodded, understanding the weight of his words. Well, you know this place. It's your home too. If there's anything we can do to help. Her offer was interrupted by a group of teenagers who approached James, their expressions a mix of curiosity and respect. Officer Marshall, we saw what happened. One of them said, a young girl named Tasha. It's messed up. We're with you. Their support was straightforward and honest, typical of the youth he had come to admire and respect. James felt a surge of gratitude. Thanks, Tasha. That means a lot. Encouraged by this support, James spent the afternoon helping with homework and discussing the community's issues openly. The conversation naturally veered towards discussions about racism and discrimination. It was a tough, often painful dialogue, but James faced it head-on, facilitating a conversation that was both enlightening and therapeutic. The center organized an impromptu forum to discuss the incident and broader social issues. The room was packed, a testament to the community's engagement and concern. James sat in the front row, not as a speaker, but as a member of the community, listening and learning from the diverse perspectives shared. As the discussion unfolded, a local activist, Marlene, took the floor. What happened to James is a symptom of a larger disease, she declared, her voice firm. We need to address not just that one incident, but the environment that allows such discrimination to fester. The crowd murmured in agreement. Calls for action were made, 
ranging from organizing peaceful protests to setting up workshops on racial sensitivity and legal rights. James listened, his heart heavy but hopeful. The community was rallying, not just behind him, but behind the cause of justice and equality. After the forum, James was approached by several people, offering handshakes and words of encouragement. Among them was Sarah, the waitress from the diner. She looked nervous, but determined. Officer Marshall, I, I have something that might help you. Can we talk in private? Curious and intrigued, James nodded, and they stepped aside. Sarah pulled out her phone, her hands slightly trembling. I recorded what that manager said to you after you left that day. I didn't know if I should, but... Her voice trailed off as she handed him the phone. The recording was clear, capturing more derogatory remarks and threats made by the manager towards James. It was the kind of evidence that could change the entire narrative. James looked at Sarah, a mix of shock and gratitude on his face. Sarah, this could be significant. Thank you for stepping forward. As they talked further, James realized that this evidence not only bolstered his case, but also strengthened the community's resolve to fight discrimination. It was a turning point, one that marked a shift from passive suffering to active resistance. With the digital recording securely on his phone, James, accompanied by Sarah, marched into the Detroit police station. The weight of the situation hung heavy in the air, but James felt a surge of cautious optimism. This evidence could potentially turn the tides in his favor. As they approached the front desk, James asked to speak with the officer in charge of handling discrimination complaints. They were quickly ushered into a small, stark room where they met Deputy Chief Lawson, a stern man known for his by-the-book approach to law enforcement. James explained the situation and played the recording. Sarah corroborated the story, her voice steady despite the obvious nerves. Lawson listened intently, his expression unreadable. When the recording ended, he sighed, rubbing his temples. This is serious, Lawson admitted. I'll have Hank brought in for questioning immediately. Sarah and James exchanged a hopeful glance as Lawson made a few calls. Within hours, Hank was in custody, his arrogance diminished somewhat by the formal setting of the police interrogation room. However, the victory was short-lived. By late afternoon, news reached James that Hank was released on bail. More troubling, charges were being pressed against James for alleged assault during the altercation. The deputy chief, who had seemed supportive, now appeared distant and formal. Officer Marshall, while the recording does raise concerns about Mr. Hank's conduct, there are also allegations against you that we must investigate, Lawson explained, his voice firm. Given Hank's connections in the community and the conflicting reports from other witnesses, we're in a difficult position. Stunned, James felt the ground shift beneath him. It wasn't just a battle against prejudice anymore, it was a struggle to clear his name from criminal allegations. Leaving the station, James and Sarah sat in her car, the silence between them thick with disbelief. What now? Sarah finally asked, her eyes filled with worry. James looked out the window, watching the sun set over the cityscape. Now we fight harder, he said with a resolve that surprised even him. I'm not just going to clear my name. I'm going to expose the corruption that lets men like Hank get away with their actions. The following days were grueling. James used his knowledge as a police officer to dig deeper into Hank's background. He discovered that Hank was indeed connected to influential figures in Detroit, including a prominent city councilor known for his conservative views on law enforcement and racial issues. Meanwhile, Sarah proved to be an invaluable ally. Using her position at the diner, she gathered more testimonies from co-workers who had also witnessed Hank's discriminatory behavior but had been too afraid to speak up. Together, they compiled a dossier of evidence, not just against Hank, but highlighting the systemic issues that allowed such injustices to continue. As James prepared for his own defense, the community rallied behind him. 
The support was not just vocal but active, with community leaders organizing rallies and legal funds being set up to aid his case. One evening, as James and Sarah reviewed their collected evidence in the quiet of his living room, Sarah placed her hand over his. Whatever happens, you're not alone in this, she said earnestly. You fought for us. Now it's our turn to fight for you. James felt a warmth spread through him, not from the setting sun but from the solidarity Sarah and the community showed him. It wasn't just his battle anymore. It had become their collective fight for justice. The air was thick with tension as James walked up the steps of the Detroit courthouse. The sky overhead was overcast, mirroring the gloom that had settled over his life since the charges were made public. Flanked by Sarah and his lawyer, James felt every eye on him as he entered the courthouse, a place he had visited many times before in a very different capacity. Inside, the courtroom was already filling up, the buzz of whispered conversations echoing off the high ceilings. Reporters jotted notes eagerly, their cameras flashing intermittently. As James took his seat, he noticed several of his colleagues from the precinct among the spectators. Their expressions ranged from supportive to suspicious. The hearing began with the prosecutor outlining the charges against James, assault and disturbing the peace. The evidence presented was a mixture of witness statements and security camera footage from the diner, which had been cleverly edited to highlight James's actions without context. James's lawyer, a seasoned civil rights attorney named Elena, countered fiercely. She pointed out inconsistencies in the witness testimonies and stressed the provocation James had faced. Then, she played Sarah's recording, which captured Hank's discriminatory remarks. The courtroom was silent as the recording played, the weight of Hank's words hanging heavy in the air. But the mood shifted when the prosecutor called a surprise witness, Hank himself. Looking smug, Hank spun a tale of feeling threatened by James, a narrative supported by his connections in the community. As Hank spoke, James felt a surge of anger and helplessness. It was clear that Hank was using his influence to manipulate the situation. But before he could dwell on this further, a commotion erupted outside the courtroom. Word had spread about the trial, and a large crowd had gathered in support of James. Chants of justice for James and stop racial discrimination could be heard even through the thick courthouse walls. The judge, annoyed and distracted by the noise, called for a recess. During the break, James and Sarah stepped outside to see the crowd. The sight of so many people from all walks of life, holding signs and chanting in solidarity gave James a renewed sense of purpose. Among the crowd, he spotted faces from the community center, local activists, and even some of his neighbors. Sarah squeezed his hand, whispering, Look at all the people you've touched, James. We're not giving up. As they re-entered the courthouse, news reached them that a key piece of evidence had been found by one of Sarah's co-workers, a video taken by a diner patron that showed the entire incident from a different angle. This video not only captured the full exchange between James and Hank, but also the moments leading up to the altercation, offering a clearer picture of Hank's aggressive behavior. Energized by this development and the public support, James and Elena prepared to present this new evidence. But as they did, James noticed a pair of plainclothes officers speaking with the prosecutor, their expressions serious. Moments later, he was approached with news that would change everything once again. The city councilor connected to Hank was under investigation for corruption, and this case was now part of a larger inquiry. The layers of corruption and influence were starting to unravel, putting James's struggle into a broader context of systemic abuse and racial injustice. The battle was far from over, but now, with the community behind him and new evidence in hand, James felt ready to fight not just for his own name, but for change in the system that had brought him to this point. As the corruption investigation into the city councilor linked to Hank gained momentum, 
the ramifications rippled through Detroit's political and law enforcement landscapes. Media outlets, once only mildly interested in James's case, now poured resources into uncovering the depth of corruption affecting the city. James found himself unexpectedly at the center of a story much larger than his own. James and Sarah worked tirelessly with Elena to prepare for the upcoming legal battles, but now their efforts were bolstered by investigative journalists and whistleblowers who began to come forward. New evidence suggested that Hank's connections were not just influential, but part of a broader network that included several high-ranking officials. The public outcry grew as details of the investigation leaked. Protests demanding transparency and accountability from city officials became daily occurrences. James, once a solitary figure in his fight for justice, was now a symbol of a much larger struggle against systemic corruption and racism. Inside the precinct, the mood was tense. James's colleagues, previously divided in their opinions, began to view him in a new light as the investigation uncovered more about the counselor's influence on police affairs. Some officers who had remained neutral or skeptical now approached James, offering new testimonies and evidence that supported his innocence and highlighted misconduct by Hank and his allies. One evening, James was called into a meeting with the police chief and several internal affairs investigators. The chief, a grizzled veteran who had seen his share of city politics, looked tired but resolute. Officer Marshall, your case has opened a can of worms that I suspect goes deeper than any of us realized. The chief began. We're now looking at a series of questionable actions by the counselor and his associates. This isn't just about a diner incident anymore. James listened, his resolve hardened. Sir, I want to help in any way I can. This isn't just about clearing my name. It's about making sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. The chief nodded, appreciating James's commitment. I'm reinstating you to active duty, effective immediately. We need officers like you on the force, especially now. Later that week, James visited the community center, which had become a hub for organizing protests and legal aid sessions. The center was buzzing with activity, and as James walked in, he was greeted with applause and cheers. It was a stark contrast to the uncertainty and isolation he had felt just weeks earlier. Sarah, who had been coordinating community support efforts, updated him. The counselor is facing charges, and it looks like they're going to make some arrests soon. Hank's in deep, too. They've got evidence linking him to bribes and other illegal activities. As they spoke, a young man approached James with a folder. Officer Marshall, I think you should see this, he said, handing over documents. They were financial records showing transactions between Hank's Diner and a company owned by the counselor. That night, as James poured over the documents, he realized the full extent of the corruption. It wasn't just about racial discrimination, it was about economic exploitation and control. The community had been manipulated by those sworn to protect and serve it. With new evidence in hand, James prepared for the next court date. This time, he wasn't just fighting for his own justice, he was fighting for the soul of Detroit. The upcoming trial was no longer just about an assault charge, it was a public reckoning for years of systemic abuse. As the city braced for more revelations, James stood firm, ready to confront whatever came next. He knew the road ahead would be fraught with challenges, but with the community's support and the truth on his side, he was determined to see it through to the end. The evening air was crisp as James and Sarah stepped out of the bustling community center. Their spirits were high. The recent developments in James's case pointed towards a positive resolution, and the community's support had never been stronger. As they walked toward the parking lot, James turned to Sarah with a grateful smile. Sarah, I can't thank you enough for everything. How about dinner tonight? My treat he suggested, his tone light but sincere. Sarah returned his smile, a touch of color rising in her cheeks. I'd like that, James. It's been a whirlwind, hasn't it?
Their laughter mingled with the gentle evening breeze, a rare moment of levity in the midst of their tumultuous journey. But as they approached James's car, the sudden roar of engines sliced through their conversation. Six bikers, masked and menacing, turned the corner and sped towards them with alarming speed. James's hand instinctively reached for his side, only to remember he had left his firearm in the car. The color drained from his face as one of the bikers drew a gun, aiming directly at him. Time seemed to slow as James's life flashed before his eyes, the painful loss of his wife during childbirth, the brief life of his son he never got to meet, and now, it seemed, the end of his own story on a quiet city street. But fate had other plans. In a split second that felt like an eternity, Sarah stepped in front of him, her eyes wide with a mixture of fear and determination. The gunshot echoed loudly in the evening air, and Sarah collapsed into James's arms. No, Sarah, why? James cried out, his voice cracking as he lowered her gently to the ground, pressing his hand against the wound in a futile attempt to stem the bleeding. This isn't your time, James, Sarah gasped, her voice faint. You have to fight, not just for yourself, but for everyone who's been wronged. As the bikers disappeared into the twilight, James's calls for help finally summoned an ambulance. He rode with Sarah to the hospital, his mind reeling from the shock and his heart heavy with guilt. At the hospital, after hours of anxious waiting, a surgeon approached James. She's stable, but still critical. We've done all we can for now. She needs time to recover. James nodded, his throat tight with emotion. He watched through the window as the medical team worked around Sarah, her condition precarious, but stable. When he was finally allowed to see her, the sight of Sarah, so vibrant and fierce, now lying silent and pale, was almost more than he could bear. Sitting by her bedside, James clasped her hand, his tears falling freely. You shouldn't have had to do that, Sarah. You've already done so much, he whispered, his voice thick with emotion. He stayed there throughout the night, grappling with the enormity of Sarah's sacrifice and the ongoing danger they both faced. His resolve hardened. This fight was no longer just his own. It was for Sarah, for his late wife and son, and for anyone who had ever suffered injustice. As dawn broke over the city, James raised his eyes from Sarah's still form and whispered a prayer, not just for her recovery, but for strength. He knew that the road ahead was fraught with more challenges, but he was no longer alone in his fight. James sat in the muted glow of the hospital room, the steady beep of the monitors providing a constant, albeit uneasy, comfort. He hadn't left Sarah's side since she was admitted, his concern growing with each passing hour. Despite his exhaustion, James kept his phone close, coordinating with his colleagues who were tirelessly scouring the city for any trace of the bikers. As dawn crept into the room, casting long shadows across the sterile walls, the door opened quietly. Sarah's parents, whom James had never met, stepped in. Their expressions were fraught with worry, which quickly shifted to disapproval upon seeing James. Are you the officer she's been helping? Sarah's father asked, his voice terse. Yes, sir, I'm James Marshall. I. We know who you are, her mother cut in sharply. And you need to leave. It's because of you our daughter is lying here like this. Stunned, James stood up, his intention to explain himself cut short by the pain in their eyes. He understood their anger, misplaced as it was, and nodded slowly. I'm very sorry. I just want Sarah to be okay, he murmured, before quietly stepping out of the room. James didn't go far, though. He settled in the hospital lobby, a silent guardian waiting for any news. Throughout the night, nurses passed him, offering sympathetic glances and the occasional coffee, recognizing the torment of a loved one reflected in his weary gaze. Morning light brought with it a change. Sarah's parents emerged from the elevator, 
their overnight bags in hand. Spotting James, they paused. The resolve in his eyes, the evident lack of sleep, and his unwavering presence softened their initial judgment. Mr. Marshall, Sarah's father began, his voice softer. We saw you didn't leave last night. We're sorry for what we said. James stood, his respect for their grief still paramount. I understand. It's a hard time for all of us. Just then, a nurse hurried out from the ICU, her face bright. She's awake, and she's asking for James. Sarah's parents exchanged a look, the realization of their mistake dawning fully. Without a word, they gestured for James to follow them back to Sarah's room. As they entered, Sarah's weak but smiling face turned towards the door. James, she whispered, her voice hoarse but filled with warmth. James rushed to her side, taking her hand gently. Tears welled in his eyes as he looked down at her, the relief overwhelming. I'm here, Sarah. You're going to be okay. Sarah's parents stood back, watching the reunion, their earlier hostility replaced by a burgeoning respect for the man their daughter had so fiercely defended and supported. I'm sorry, James, Sarah's mother said, stepping forward. We didn't understand how much you meant to each other, how much you've been through together. James shook his head slightly, dismissing their apologies. Nothing to forgive. I'm just grateful she's awake. The room filled with a new, lighter air as everyone's relief mingled, overshadowing the previous tension. Sarah squeezed James's hand, her strength growing with the support surrounding her. The hospital room was quiet except for the soft hum of machines and the distant sounds of activity in the hallways. James sat beside Sarah's bed, his eyes studying her face, which, despite the paleness and fatigue, was filled with resolve. Sarah, James began, his voice low and cautious. I need to understand why. Why you did what you did. Taking a bullet, it's not something you just do without a damn good reason. Sarah shifted slightly in her bed, her gaze meeting his. There was a depth in her eyes, a mixture of pain and determination. James, you've become more than just a friend to me, more than just a colleague fighting for justice, she said, her voice steady despite her condition. James listened intently, his heart heavy with a mix of admiration and guilt. You represent something bigger, James, Sarah continued. You stand for a fight that many have been losing for too long. Against racism, against corruption. You've given hope where there was resignation. Your fight isn't just your own. It's ours. All of us who faced discrimination and felt powerless. James's eyes widened slightly, the weight of her words sinking in. Sarah, I... She held up a hand, stopping him. Let me finish. It's not just about the cause, James. These past weeks, being with you, fighting alongside you, I've come to feel more than just admiration. I've come to care for you deeply. Her cheeks flushed a light pink, the confession hanging between them like a delicate thread. James was silent for a moment, the implications of her words swirling in his mind. The realization that their relationship had evolved into something deeper was both surprising and not. The long hours together, the shared purpose, the mutual support, it had all laid a foundation for something more profound than either had anticipated. Sarah, I... James struggled to find the right words. I care about you too, more than I thought possible in such a short time but I never wanted you to risk your life for me. Sarah smiled weakly. I know, and I didn't make that choice lightly. But in that moment, I couldn't bear the thought of losing you. Not just for me, but for what losing you would mean to the cause. You have to finish this fight, James. For all of us. The room fell silent again, the only sound the soft beep of the heart monitor. They sat there, Connected by an understanding that had been unspoken until now, a bond forged not just by shared ideals, but by personal sacrifice and newfound affection. James took her hand, his grip gentle but firm. I promise you, Sarah, 
Your sacrifice won't be in vain. We'll see this through, together. Sarah nodded, her eyes closing briefly as if to cement the promise. Together, she whispered. The atmosphere in the hospital room had settled into a quiet routine, with James often by Sarah's side as she continued to recover. Their conversations, once filled with discussions of strategies and justice, now also wove through deeper, more personal themes. However, the fight outside the hospital walls was far from over, and both were acutely aware of the challenges that awaited them. Their contemplative silence was broken by the abrupt arrival of Detective Martinez, a close colleague of James from the precinct. He entered the room with an urgency that immediately set James on edge. James, we've got one of them, Martinez announced, his voice a mix of fatigue and excitement. One of the bikers was picked up last night in a raid. He's talking, and it looks like we might finally get some answers. James straightened up, his focus sharpening. Do we know who orchestrated the hit? Not yet, but this guy seems ready to spill everything to avoid a long sentence. We're keeping the pressure on, Martinez replied, glancing at Sarah with a nod of respect. Sarah met James's gaze, her expression a mixture of hope and apprehension. This could be it, James. The break we've needed. James nodded, his mind racing with the implications. I need to be there, Martinez. I need to hear it for myself. Martinez agreed, and within an hour, James was at the precinct, sitting behind the one-way mirror of the interrogation room. The biker, a rugged man with a defiant look, seemed to crumble under the weight of his situation as the interrogation progressed. After hours of intense questioning, the biker finally broke. All right, all right. It wasn't my idea, okay? I was just following orders, he blurted, his voice cracking with desperation. Whose orders? The lead detective pressed, his voice stern. The biker hesitated, his eyes darting around the room as if seeking an escape. Finally, he exhaled sharply. It was Hank. Hank orchestrated the whole thing. He said the cop was causing too much trouble, getting too close to something big. The room fell silent as the detectives absorbed the revelation. James, listening from behind the mirror, felt a cold fury settle in his chest. Hank's vendetta had escalated far beyond any of them had imagined. The detectives worked quickly after that, coordinating raids to pick up the remaining bikers, including the sniper. When the last biker was apprehended, he confirmed the first story, adding chilling details about how Hank had promised them protection under his influential connections. James returned to the hospital, his emotions a tumultuous mix of relief and anger. As he entered Sarah's room, he saw her looking up expectantly. They've got them all, Sarah. It was Hank. He orchestrated the hit. James explained, his voice tense. Sarah's expression hardened with a resolve that matched James's. Then it's not over yet. This goes deeper than just a street vendetta. It's corruption rooted in power. James nodded, his determination renewed by Sarah's words. We'll take him down, Sarah. All of them. No one else should have to suffer because of their greed and hatred. In the quiet of the hospital room, with only the soft beeping of monitors and the distant murmurs of the night shift staff, James sat beside Sarah, both lost in thought. The dim light from the bedside lamp cast long shadows across the room, mirroring the somber mood that enveloped them. Sarah... Looking stronger, yet still fragile, turned to James, her voice soft. Can you believe it all started with just a lunch break? A simple decision to go to the diner? James sighed, running his fingers through his hair, a tired smile touching his lips. It feels like a lifetime ago. I just wanted a burger, and now here we are, caught up in something that feels much bigger than us. Sarah reached out, her hand finding his. But it's not just about us, is it? It's about standing up to something that's been wrong for too long. Hank's racism, his corruption, it's like he's a symbol of all that's been unchallenged until now. 
James nodded, his eyes reflecting a mix of anger and resolve. Yeah, his disdain wasn't just directed at me. It's clear now he's been manipulating and hurting many more. His actions are part of a larger pattern we see too often. They sat in silence for a moment, each lost in their own thoughts about the events that had unfolded. James broke the silence, his voice tinged with a mixture of wonder and concern. Did you ever think that standing up at that moment would lead us here? Sarah smiled weakly, a spark of her usual fire flickering in her eyes. I didn't know where it would lead. I just knew it was the right thing to do. But James, seeing how far Hank was willing to go, how deep the roots of his hatred and corruption ran, it scares me. It scares me too, James admitted. But it also strengthens my resolve. We've exposed him, and now we can't let up. We have to see this through, not just for us, but for everyone who's been on the receiving end of such blatant injustice. Sarah squeezed his hand, her grip firm despite her weakness. I know, and I'll be with you every step of the way. What you're doing, what we're fighting for, it matters. It's bigger than just getting justice for what happened at the diner or even what happened to me. It's about changing how things are done, about holding people like Hank accountable. James looked out the window, where the lights of the city twinkled against the night sky. When this is over, I want to make sure no one else has to go through what you did, what so many others have gone through. And we will, Sarah said, her voice resolute with each other's help. The hospital, once a sanctuary of healing, had transformed overnight into a fortress. News that Hank had vanished after learning of the biker's confession sent ripples of alarm through the law enforcement community. James, sitting in the hospital room with Sarah, listened intently as Detective Martinez outlined the situation. We went to bring Hank in, but he's gone. Left behind a note mocking us, saying you'll never catch him, Martinez reported, his frustration evident. He's officially a fugitive now, and considering what's at stake, he might be desperate. James's jaw tightened as he processed the news. What about Sarah's safety? And the hospital staff? We've increased security around the hospital. Undercover officers in every wing and regular patrols around the clock, Martinez assured him. We're not taking any chances. Sarah, who had been quietly listening, spoke up, her voice steady despite the clear danger. What about the other people Hank might go after? Anyone connected to the case could be at risk. Martinez nodded. We're coordinating with local law enforcement to provide protection to all key witnesses and their families. We're casting a wide net to find Hank before he can make any moves. The tension in the room was palpable, with the realization that Hank's desperation could lead to unpredictable actions. James looked out the window, his mind racing with scenarios, each more troubling than the last. Later that evening, as the city lights flickered on against the growing darkness, the hospital corridors buzzed with a quiet tension. Security personnel discreetly patrolled the area, their presence a reassuring yet stark reminder of the threat looming over them. James and Sarah, confined to the hospital room, found themselves grappling with the weight of their situation. This is exactly what Hank wants, James said, pacing the room. He wants us scared, hiding. It's his way of regaining control. Sarah reached for his hand, pulling him to a stop. Then we don't let him win. We stay strong, and we see this through. The police are doing everything they can to find him. James nodded, the resolve firming in his eyes. And we'll be ready for him if he tries anything. I'm not letting anyone else get hurt because of him. The night passed with a tense vigilance. James hardly slept, his senses keyed up to every sound, every shadow that passed under the door. By morning, the hospital had taken on the air of a guarded compound, with police officers and security personnel in constant motion. As dawn broke, James stood by the window, watching the city wake up. 
The fear that had gripped him the night before had settled into a determined anger. He knew the road ahead would be dangerous, but he was committed to ending Hank's reign of terror, for Sarah's sake, for the city's, and for his own. The city had never felt more like a battleground. From the makeshift command center at the precinct, Detective Martinez and his team coordinated a citywide manhunt for Hank. The urgency was palpable. Every officer knew the stakes were higher than ever. Maps plastered on every wall were marked with possible sightings and areas of interest. Teams of officers, assisted by federal agents, swept through known hideouts and places Hank was rumored to frequent. Every tip was followed up with precision and speed, but Hank remained elusive, always seemingly one step ahead. Keep the pressure on, Martinez instructed his team. He can't stay underground forever. Check every lead, no matter how small it seems. Meanwhile, surveillance footage from traffic cameras, ATMs, and public spaces was being scrutinized around the clock. Analysts worked tirelessly, their eyes glued to screens, searching for any trace of Hank or his associates. As the search intensified, James received regular updates from Martinez. Despite being confined to the hospital, he felt a relentless drive to contribute. Using his own contacts and knowledge of the city, he provided insights and suggestions on where Hank might try to hide. One afternoon, a breakthrough came. A traffic camera captured a glimpse of a vehicle matching the description of Hank's car heading towards an industrial area of the city. The footage was grainy, but the license plate matched one of Hank's known vehicles. Got him, one of the analysts exclaimed, zooming in on the image. Sending units now. Martinez coordinated the response, dispatching SWAT teams and setting up a perimeter around the suspected location, a rundown warehouse district that had seen better days. The area was quickly cordoned off, with no one allowed in or out without strict verification. James, on the phone with Martinez, felt a surge of adrenaline. Be careful, Martinez. He's desperate, and that makes him dangerous. We're prepared, James. We'll get him, Martinez assured, his voice resolute over the line. As the SWAT teams moved in, the tension reached a fever pitch. Helicopters circled overhead, their spotlights cutting through the twilight as officers on the ground moved in tactical formations. The operation was executed with clinical precision, each team member aware that any mistake could lead to deadly consequences. After hours of careful maneuvering, the moment of truth arrived. Hank was found hiding in a decrepit storage room, armed but looking cornered and defeated. The standoff was tense, with officers trained on him from every angle. Give it up, Hank. It's over, the commanding officer called out. Hank, sweating and shaking, knew he had no way out. With a grimace of defeat, he threw his weapon to the ground, raising his hands in surrender. The relief among the team was palpable as Hank was handcuffed and led away. Martinez, watching the arrest through a live feed at the command center, let out a long-held breath. Good work, team. Let's bring him in. The city of Detroit had been following the case with bated breath, and the day of Hank's trial drew crowds both inside and outside the courthouse. Media vans lined the streets, and reporters jostled for comments from anyone who looked remotely involved. Amid this frenzy, James walked into the courthouse, his steps steady but his mind racing with anticipation and anxiety. Inside, the courtroom was packed, a tangible buzz of conversation filling the air until the judge entered, and the room fell into a respectful silence. James took a seat at the back, his eyes never leaving Hank, who sat looking defiant yet visibly nervous as he conferred with his lawyer. The prosecution opened with a powerful statement, outlining the case against Hank for orchestrating the attempted murder of a police officer, obstruction of justice, and his involvement in a deeper network of corruption and racial hatred. 
The evidence was compelling, including testimonies from the arrested bikers, surveillance footage, and the crucial recording Sarah had made at the diner. As the trial progressed, Sarah, now significantly recovered, took the stand. Her testimony was calm but firm, recounting the events that led up to her injury and pointing out Hank's direct role in the escalation of violence. When asked why she had stepped in front of James, her answer was simple yet profound, because it was the right thing to do and because I knew what Hank was capable of. James listened, his heart swelling with a mix of pride and pain. When his turn came, he detailed his interactions with Hank, the racial slurs, and the threats. His voice did not waver. It carried through the courtroom, every word underscoring the danger and discrimination he had faced. The defense tried to paint Hank as a misunderstood businessman who had been framed by overzealous police work, but the evidence was overwhelming. Witnesses from the community, including other victims of Hank's discriminatory practices, bolstered the prosecution's case, painting a clear picture of a man who used his power to intimidate and harm. After days of intense testimonies and legal arguments, the case was handed over to the jury. The wait for the verdict was agonizing. James and Sarah, along with their friends, family, and a significant portion of the community, held a vigil outside the courthouse, awaiting justice. Finally, the jury returned, and the courtroom hushed to a near-silent hum as the foreman stood up. In the case of the state versus Hank, we find the defendant guilty on all counts. A wave of relief and jubilation swept through the courtroom. Cheers erupted from the public gallery, while James and Sarah embraced, tears of relief mingling with smiles of victory. Hank was led away, his future now confined to the consequences of his actions. Outside the courthouse, James addressed the gathered crowd, his words broadcasted live. Today's verdict is not just a win for me. It's a win for every person who has ever been told they don't belong, for every voice that has been silenced by fear. It's a step toward a future where justice and decency prevail over hatred and corruption. After the tumultuous events and the high-profile trial, the city of Detroit began to show signs of healing and change. James and Sarah, now widely recognized as symbols of courage and justice, found themselves at the forefront of community efforts to promote inclusivity and accountability. James, having taken a brief sabbatical from the police force to recover and reflect, returned with a new role. He was asked to lead a community liaison team, a new division dedicated to building bridges between the police and the communities they serve. His first-hand experiences, coupled with his unwavering commitment to justice, made him a respected figure not only among his peers, but also among the citizens of Detroit. Sarah, on the other hand, channeled her passion into activism, working with local organizations to support victims of racial discrimination and violence. Her recovery had only strengthened her resolve, and her story inspired many to speak out and stand up against injustice. Together, they hosted workshops and talks, not just in Detroit but across neighboring cities, sharing their story and the lessons they learned about resilience, justice, and the power of community support. Amid their public engagements, James and Sarah also found time for personal growth. They often visited schools and universities, speaking to students about civil rights, the legal system, and the importance of community activism. Their relationship, forged in the fires of conflict and trauma, had blossomed into a deep, enduring partnership. James proposed to Sarah at the very diner where their ordeal had begun, now under new management and transformed into a symbol of community unity. It was a poignant moment, marked by personal triumph and collective healing. The impact of their case had far-reaching implications. Legislation was introduced to ensure more stringent oversight of law enforcement interactions with the community, and a foundation was established in Sarah's name to provide legal aid to those who couldn't afford it. 
As the city landscape changed, so did its heart. The diner became a community center on weekends, hosting events that brought diverse groups together to share meals and stories, fostering understanding and compassion among its residents. One crisp autumn evening, James and Sarah walked through a revitalized neighborhood, the leaves crunching under their feet. They stopped in front of a mural depicting various community leaders, including a likeness of them both, painted by a local artist. Look at us, Sarah said, leaning against James. Part of the city's history now. James wrapped an arm around her, his gaze thoughtful. We're part of its future, too. What we went through, it changed us, but it also changed this place. For the better. They continued their walk, their conversation turning to plans for their upcoming wedding and other community projects. They knew the road ahead would have its challenges, but they faced it with optimism and determination, supported by a community that had learned the value of standing together. If you enjoyed the story, please leave a like, and this other video that's probably appearing on the screen now will likely move you too. Enjoy the session, and until the next video.